So now we are ready for baseball. Tennessee and Illinois game two of this series. Drew Beam on the mound making his fourth start of the year. And away we go. Starts off with a first pitch fastball for a strike. 94 miles per hour on the radar gun for Drew Beam to get going against Illinois. Brad one for three last night. Down in the order to stay in the leadoff spot for the Fighting Illini. Just past Christian Moore, a base hit for Brad to start this game for Illinois at the plate. Yeah, starting off kind of a similar look that we saw yesterday from Illinois. They got up, they got runners on early to see if they can produce the same way. Calhasia next up, shortstop off to a great start this season, hitting 319, the senior from Oswego, Illinois. Van Hartlip, head coach of the Fighting Illini, likes the team he's seeing this year. He's looking for some consistency off to a 5-7 and seven start. One and foul for strike one. Everybody clap your hands. Asia, two hit night last night, going two for four. And a first inning double that led to Illinois' first run. Fastball runs inside, even the count. Yeah, when you watch Drew Beam pitch, you're going to see some arm side run on that fastball. He doesn't have necessarily the big pitch metrics that a lot of people talk about. He does better working bottom half of the zone, getting a lot of ground balls. Now he gets in front of the ball and two strikes on Hazia. Six innings, a season high, nine strikeouts. Last time out against Bowling Green for Drew Beam. Checks the runner at first, Asher Brad. One, two. A little upstairs, two and two. Got him swinging. First strike out for Drew Bean. That's our first. For queso. Yeah, doubled up on changeups right here, 85-85. Again, he's going to work oh, east to west. He's going to try to sneak pitches in under their hands like he did on the changeup, and then the slider's going to be the west pitch breaking away from him. 16 strikeouts compared to only one walk this season. Now Camden Janik steps in. Back in, standing up. Camden Janik, a 362 hitter. Last night picked up an RBI double in the first inning that gave the Illini the early advantage before Tennessee would respond with three runs in the bottom of the first. Fastball 93. Yeah, Roger, Janik's been on a tear over the last eight games. 419 clip, two home runs to go along with five doubles. Side to the off speed, one and one. Once again, Beams gets in front of the ball and two strikes. Went back to the changeup. Beam got off to such a great start to his collegiate career as a freshman in 2022, the SEC Freshman of the Year. Freshman All-America selection. He's always had that good four-pitch mix. We just speaked off with Tony Vitello. Continues to get more comfortable, especially in his role as a leader on this team. I mean, he's a really good athlete. Things have been highlighted before. Obviously, played quarterback for his high school. Came into Tennessee with a relatively fresh arm. Had a couple of injuries and got pinned into that Sunday spot. And, man, he has shined from there.
Now they're checking first. One stolen base this year. The Illini not too aggressive on the base pass. Three for six in terms of stolen bases this season. But Drew Beam has always been known as a guy who pulled runners well. Yeah, yeah, really good athlete. I mean, that's kind of been the rap on Tennessee the last couple of years. Good athletes, but they're a little slower to the plate. There's opportunities to steal some bases. And I think Brad's going to look for an opportunity to do so. It's gone high in the air into right center. Tears is over. Out number two. <laughs> Quick conversation for Janig with Quagliano. You always love those scouting reports from your friends right after they face somebody like Drew Bean. Yeah, Janik's a true leader, and you could see yesterday, I mean, very disciplined at the, the plate. He saw a lot of pitches. He, he doesn't panic with two strikes. Same thing. He's got a good feel for what's going on. I mean, he's going through the entire dugout right now. Colton Quagliano taking a first pitch strike. Quagliano, the third baseman, hitting 260 to start this season. Last night went one for five at the plate. Also drove in a run for the Illini. Runner goes. Swing and a miss for a strike. The throw goes to second. And play at second for the out. But thought maybe there was going to be some batter's interference there as well. Yeah, he was going to get called for interference regardless. What you're going to see on this play, this is what happens when the when the turf gets slick. You have to slide earlier. If not, it's going to pull you past the bag. These six home runs, just 15 games, 136 runs batted in as a team. A team batting average of 324. Good challenge today with tabling, and now Christian Moore will be the first to the plate for the Big Orange. Two for four in last night's win. Top of the first came to a close. Officially in the books is caught stealing. We thought also batters interference would have been called anyway. Yeah, I think it's just going to end up being a ruling for the stat book of, of what happens. I think we will we'll get an understanding when we come here too, whether they called the batters interference or if it was out, and we'll just go from there. Tabling misses low on the first pitch to Christian Moore. Yeah, that's the one thing I wish we had. I wish we had a mic so we could hear what's going on because me and you are kind of left out at the moment too. So. It'll be interesting for all of us. Breaking ball misses high, more in front. Two balls and a strike against Tabling. There's Moore's double that really kick-started Tennessee with three runs in the bottom of the first yesterday. Strokes this high into center. Backing up on it is Asher Brad. And he puts it away for the first down in the bottom of the first. Now batting the first baseman, number 25, Clay Burke. Good to see the rain has gone away from Lindsey Nelson Stadium after it rained the hardest, really, at the plate meeting for both coaches with the umpires. Fans are able to take some cover, but it's lightened up. Able to play baseball on time here on Rocky Top. Blake Burke takes a fastball in 92 miles per hour for strike one. RBI double for Burke last night, part of a one for three performance against the Fighting Illini. <laughs> Tabling in front, 0-2. Four homers already this season for Blake Burke. Get some contact. Stick around at 0-2. Is that the first plus curveball we've seen from Tabling? Yeah, that's the curveball at 77 right there. He tends to lean towards the slider a little bit more than the 12 to 6, but the 12 to 6 is the chase pitch that typically ends up out of the zone. 
And then you're going to see he's going to match that 12 to 6. That's that elevated fastball. He has a really good vertical angle of attack. And what that means at home, fastball rides for a long time. It's hard to get the barrel up in that pitch up in the zone. Bird fouling off another curveball. Spin around and a one ball, two strike count. Four home runs, 11 runs batted in for Burke. change up at 88. That's been the one thing you're going to see on tabling right now. Really good stuff. He's been a little erratic on, on finding some pitches in the zone. Tennessee's going to have to be patient off of him. Fair ball down the left field line. Burke hustling the second. Another first inning double for Blake Burke. Well, that's one way to beat the shift, for sure. You'll take that all day if you're Blake Burke. There is no such thing as a cheap hit. If you want to play the shift, we're going to hit it in that opening, pick up another double on an absolute tear. I think that puts him in the lead for doubles in the SEC right there. Under. His 10th of the season. All dug out, fired up, trying to strike first against Illinois. Opportunity for Billy Barrels, Billy Amick to the plate. Mighty cut for strike one. Home run last night for Billy Amick, so he's now tied with Drew Burris of Georgia Tech for the NCAA lead in home runs. And this has been common. We've seen a lot of people attack Amick the same way. He's going to get a heavy dose. First pitch, 12-6 curveball. That was the slider at 83. There's a lot of people that are kind of staying away from the fastball, kind of making that more of the, sh the show pitch or the chase pitch against him. Oh, wow. Bounces right back into play. Amick beats it out. Men on the corners for the Vols. Yeah, wait till you see this on the replay. Look at the side spin on this ball. He kind of cue balled this off the end of his bat. It took two bounces, like like two to three feet foul, and then rolled back into play. And that's what kind of caught Schroeder off guard, too. As you see, he had to go all the way back into fair territory and make a decent runner. Man, you just don't see that kind of spin. That's wild. Schroeder did the best he could, but Amick beats it out for the infield single now. Men on the corners for Tennessee. Good opportunity in the bottom of the first. Barras Tears takes strike one. Tears a 4-13 average. Taking over that starting center field spot. Four homers along with 12 runs batted in. So he's really coming into his own this season for Tennessee. Yeah, he's been a presence in the middle of the lineup. Another guy here, last eight games, 440 average, one homer, one double. Takes curveball for a strike. One and two, tabling gets in front. Tabling with 18 strikeouts compared to seven walks this year. Could use a strikeout here. Another similar setup again. You saw it, 12-6 curveball call for a strike. He elevates a fastball. He's changing eyesight. We'll probably go down again with a changeup or something right here to try to get cheers to chase. And on the corners with one out for Tennessee. Another one fouled away just as Amick was taking off for second. Team average for tiers, but with men in scoring position hitting 357. Another check at first. Nope. 
Yeah, it's a good situation to move right now. Same thing, like you're trying to limit the double play, trying to get a guy in scoring position. Maybe he calls a bad throw. You know, run's going to be tough with tabling. I mean, he's got swing and miss stuff, so you may have to produce a little differently than you have in other games. Bounced in the turf, two and two. Good job by Schroeder, keeping everybody where they are. Burke at third, Amick at first. Two, two. Missed inside, off the glove of Schroeder. Burke scores. Tennessee with a one nothing lead in the bottom of the first. And there it is, Tennessee put a little bit of pressure on him, right? Tabling throws a slider that's up and in. Schroeder's in a throwing motion. Eyes come off the ball just a little bit early. It gets away from him. Puts Tennessee on the board and still with a runner in scoring position. Wild pitch on tabling, three and two on tiers. Knocks it foul. Tears one for four last night. Continuing his hitting streak. He'll continue it here. Base hit to center. This will go all the way to the wall. Amick will score. Tears with an RBI double. Two nothing, Big Orange. Good at bat by Tears. He didn't like a couple of pitches early on. This is where the growth and maturities happen. Shook him off, had a really good at bat, got something he could handle, got himself on second base. This is what you want to see. There's a guy like Tabling. You want to get to him early, kind of what you saw with Crowder. He's going to get better as the game gets going. Take, take advantage early on as he's missing up in the zone a little bit. Still some work to do for Tabling with Tears at second. One gone, and the first pitch is crushed by Dryling deep down the right field line, but well fouled. Dryling, of course, homered last night, his fourth home run of the season for Tennessee, off to a 370 start at the plate. Not even to a ball and a strike. Seven game hitting streak now for Dryling, coming into his own as a sophomore. Tabling in front, one and two. And you can see the gamesmanship from Tennessee right here. If you look at Tabling, lefties are hitting 350 off to him, where righties are only hitting 135. So what does Tennessee do? They stick six lefties in there and the switch hitting people. So now he's gonna have to go through seven lefties through this lineup. Called third strike on the curveball. Huge second out in this inning for Tabling. Yeah, really good pitch right here. Dryling had a couple of good swings, had no answer for the big 12 to six bender from Tabling. Gets the second out, keeps tears at second. Cannon Peebles, the catcher, stepping in for Tennessee. Last night it was Cal Stark who caught, homered in the first inning. Starts him with a curveball for strike one. Yeah, and that's the advantage of putting the lefties in. You can see tabling. The curveball's really good, the slider's good. You neutralize that by putting the lefty up. Probably doesn't have quite the same feel in the change as he does the other off-speed pitches. Peebles in front, now nothing in two, and a chance for tabling to limit the damage to a run on, to two runs on three hits in this inning. Here's it's second with two gone. Fastball a little high, one and two. Yep, same setup again. He loves 12-6. He's going to follow that, but the fastball out of the zone. It's wide open now. Blocks well by Schroeder. Tears staying at second. Two-tip. Curveball hit foul. 
Tennessee's already got the pitch count up to 25. This is something you want to see with Tabling. He had no starts in his first 33 games. He's now made three starts so far in the season. Last weekend was the longest start of his career and there's only five innings. So pitch count is going to come into concern at some point. Full count. Threw 80 pitches in those five innings against Western Michigan. Did rack up the strikeouts with seven, but also had three walks. Tears at second with two gone. Already two runs in for Tennessee. High fly ball to center. Asher Brad is there. And he'll make the grab to close out the inning. But Tennessee striking for two runs on three hits in the bottom of the. See the struggles early in SEC play. They had big names of Burns. Doe Lander had a little bit of a slow start for him. Burns moves to the bullpen. A couple of guys step up. Later on, finish the year on a good note. Think about all the fun postseason series we've seen at Lindsey Nelson Stadium. Last year had to go on the road. Won the Clemson Regional, then had to go to Hattiesburg and won that re Super Regional against Southern Miss. Yeah, very good Southern Miss team. I mean, very scrappy. Uh, interesting conditions, you know. They got Lindsey Nelson. They've got all kinds of places behind the dugout there. Southern Miss and Hattiesburg, they had to sit under the bleachers in between games and rest and all the other stuff. Wilson Quagliano leading off this inning. So we'll roll that to the second baseman Moore. That'll be the first down. So again, he was at the plate when it was Brad caught stealing. Now batting the first baseman, number 34, Greg Westcott. So one gone. Now Drake Westcott coming up to the plate. Big Ten Player of the Week. Off to a tremendous start. See his statistics in Big Ten play, or Big Ten rankings, second in home runs already with four on the year. So he had a three-homer week last week to help earn him that Big Ten Player of the Week knock. Yeah, last year Illinois hit 89 home runs. That's the second most they've hit as a team since 1998. They returned 72% of their power production. Here's the man that played a big part of it, 18 home runs last year. Scott was one for five last night against Tennessee. Strokes this in the center for a base hit. Second hit for Illinois after Asher Brad also singled back in the first. Yeah, Westcott's a strong individual right here. Got down quickly, 0-2, got a change up at 85. Hit that one a little bit off of the end, but again, strength that enabled to drive the ball to center field. Vitas Valencius coming to the plate. Designated hitter once again for Illinois. Was one for four in last night's game. Beam from the stretch. Deep in the hole to short and just past Curley. Back-to-back -back singles for the Illini. Now Westcott at second and Valencius at first with his single. And again, this is what's fun about baseball, right? You see tabling that's more up and down in the zone. Beam's going to be more east and west. Good pitch. Vetus, quick hands, able to shoot it through the hole. Looking for a big inning. Good opportunity with two on, only one gone top of the second. Jacob Schroeder, the catcher, steps in. Schroeder off to a 2-11 start at the plate this year. One homer along with three runs batted in. Being back in the strike zone to even the count. Yeah, Schroeder's been off to a little bit of a slow start right now. Last year, tons of power. Guy hit 284, 14 jacks. Second most on the team. Beam right back in the strike zone with that fastball at 94. Two on with one gone. Beam already in front at a ball and two strikes. Fastball at 93. Second strikeout for Drew Beam. 
Looks like he caught Schroeder guessing right here. You see the two seam at 93, a pitch that started out off the plate, moved back in. I mean, it's tough. Like, again, he's he got a lot of action on his fastball. Two away, Ryan Mormon at the plate. He's just missing there, ball one. Mormon hitting 161, two homers along with four runs patted in in right field. Once again for Illinois. Sharp late is short. Curly one bobble. Tries to get the out at second, but can't. Valencia's in there safely. Now the bases are loaded for the Illini. Saw Curly make an error last night on something similar as well. Sharp ground ball. He's there. He's just letting the ball get a little bit too deep, Roger. You see the same thing. Good hitters, they catch the ball out in front. Good fielders catch the ball in front of their eyesight. You saw he kind of tried to block that up with his chest. Got a little bit of a bad hop on the turf, and uh, now they got bases loaded. Fielder's choice E6, the scoring fourth error by Curley this season. Now a jam to work out of for Beam. Bases loaded with two gone. Ninth hitter in the order due up, Brody Harding. A wind up for Beam. Slides in a slider for strike one. Strike on Harding, who didn't have a multi-hit game last night, going two for four, batting ninth in the order for Illinois. Yeah, big situation here for Illinois. We saw struggles with runners in scoring position last night, currently 0-2. Harding could get them moving. And a little inside. Two balls and a strike. is loaded, two gone. Fastball <laughs> chopped to second. There's Christian Moore, and the inning is over. The Illini get the base. Yeah, 34th season on staff at Illinois. Followed his mentor, Itch Jones, from Southern Illinois to here. Well-rounded, catcher by trade, pitching coach for 10 years, associate head coach after that shortly before being named head coach in 2006. Four trips to the postseason in 11 years, 2011, 2013. Haven't been since 2019. He's got, again, a team that they're developing, still doing a lot of high school recruiting and some recruiting as well in the junior college ranks. It's a team that is going to continue improving, getting ready for a very competitive Big Ten. Taylor calling behind 3-0. and Gave up two runs on three hits in the last inning. 3-0 to Dalton Bargo, Tennessee's designated hitter. Three and two. Three and zero to a full count, trying to get the first out of this second inning. Swing on a fastball low, and it's a leadoff walk to begin Tennessee's second. Now batting the shortstop. Not only Coach Hartlett winning a lot at Illinois, but also getting players ready for the next level. Yeah, the development's really taken off since he's been here. You can see the stats on the board. 1960 to 89, 31 draft picks. Since he, Hartlett's been a part of staff, he's basically doubled their numbers in everything. They went from a pretty good college baseball program to one of the elites in the Big Ten during his tenure. Tyler J. Of course, some of the great work Cody Sedlock comes to mind. Ben Spillane. Just tremendous winners at Illinois. And Dean Curley for Tennessee, the shortstop. Nope. Fargo, one stolen bag on the year. Tennessee, 8 for 12 on the base pass this season.
Tabling gets in front, 0-2. It's 40th pitch of the start coming up. And it's outside for a ball. On the turf, two and two. Yeah, this is common to see with tabling too. He has a rather high pitches per plate appearance. On average, each hitter usually sees 4.04 pitches per at bat. Breaking ball for a called third strike. Second strikeout for tabling. You know, that'd be something I like to see him adjust as he gets going here, Roger. His stuff is really good. Maybe start attacking a lot more. I mean, it's hard to pull the trigger on that curveball right there. You see he froze Curly up with it. Like to see him go get these hitters a little bit more instead of nibbling. Check it first before the first pitch to Reese Chapman. Nope. Says that one just fell. Chapman in the mix for some playing time in the outfield. Right fielder in this ball game. Off to a 1 for 11 start at the plate this season, but trying to get some more at bats before Tennessee starts conference play next week at Alabama. Yeah, Chapman has elite power. He really hasn't got it going quite the way that the coaching staff thought he would here at Tennessee. But the, like I said, the power plays, they're going to give him opportunities to get in there because, like you said, you never know what's going to happen. Once you get into conference play, everything's wide open. Tabling in front, 0-2. And the pitch. Breaking ball outside. Rain's starting to pick up. Everybody getting the ponchos out, trying to stay dry. Got a lot of rain pregame. Both teams able to take batting practice, though. That turf field, again, you're able to play through conditions like this. Only dirt that's on the field, the mount. Yeah, and Tablin's got a little bit of a, a spike cleaner back there. You see him, he's, he's putting it to good use today. Full count with that fastball outside. Chapman. Tricky spot in this order. You have Chapman batting ninth, waiting on deck is Christian Moore, Blake Burke. Some huge bats looming for Tennessee. Argo at first, one out. Swung on and hit high down the right field line. Certainly out of play, is, and that's the spot to be under the overhang of the coaches' offices just down that right field line. Yeah, you know, I think the, the rain shifts to Tennessee's advantage a little bit. You know Drew Beam's a strike thrower. He's going to be around the plate regardless. The ball starts to get a little bit more slick where tabling's a little bit more erratic. Ball four, two aboard for Tennessee. opportunity for Christian Moore. Fly out to center field his first time up against Tabling just an inning ago in the first. Two on with just one out. First pitch slider for a strike. To the shortstop. One out at second. That's all the line I will get. Bargo will take third, and Moore is aboard on the fielder's choice. Second. 
Now batting the first baseman, number 25, Slade Burke. Blake Burke, double to start this game back in the first inning. Oh, an RBI opportunity with men on the corners. Two gone as that first pitch runs inside for a ball. Yeah, this is the guy you want up with runners in scoring position. Burke currently leads the team with a 545 average. In the air down the left field line, this will be tricky and it falls in. Tennessee adds to the lead. Fargo scores. Burke sliding into second with another RBI double, and he's made it 3 0 Tennessee. Hit it where they ain't. Quagliano had a, an unbelievable diving attempt at this ball, but I mean, Burke just hits it out in no man's land. Again, extends that average with runners in scoring position. Now you get to deal with Billy Barrels. Two double game already for Burke. Rainy Saturday afternoon. Mark Allen, pitching coach, coming out for Illinois. Talking with Logan Tabling, trying to settle him down, especially with somebody like Amick coming up to the plate. Yeah, pitch counts up to 53. You've had a little bit of bad luck. If, if you've been Tabling, you've made some quality pitches, and Tennessee's got a couple bloopers on you. Two in scoring position for Tennessee, and it's Amick at the plate. He's been a 333 hitter with two outs. 350 hitter with men in scoring position this year. Slider missing high and tied for ball one. Good baseball will be delivered out. It's tabling on the mound. Pitching in the rain here in the second inning. Tabling wants another new baseball. Already a single for Amick back in the first inning. Only in East Tennessee. Sun's <laughs> trying to shine and it's absolutely pouring. behind Amick to the wall. Another wild pitch brings in another Tennessee run as Moore scores. Make it 4-0 Tennessee. Yeah, again, if you're Tennessee, you don't mind the weather. Again, Tabling has a little bit of trouble with command. The slip, I mean, this ball just slips out of his hand. It's just how it goes. They're in search for a few more baseballs. This is going to be a little bit of an issue until this decides to calm down a little bit. Quite a slide for Moore. He's in, second time tabling, set a wild pitch, bringing a run for at least first two innings. Tamekoff's is such a great start, and the SEC Player of the Week for what he did against High Point and Bowling Green. In front, three and one. Clemson transfer joined Tennessee, and Tony Vitello described how well he fit in from the start. He didn't expect it would be as smooth as it was, but it has been. Yeah, Amick's not shy about swinging the bat, and Lindsey Nelson Stadium is, is a very good hitter's park. You get a guy that's got this kind of power, the production numbers are going to go up. Works the walk. Men on the corners again for Tennessee in this second inning. Tabling really laboring here in these first. And then Jack Crowder, the starter, really settled in for Illinois. So Tennessee trying to avoid having the same thing happen second game of this series. New 
Valley Baseball. Delivered directly to tabling on the map. Yeah, home plate Danny Umpire. He's moved the, the baseballs from out of his pocket because they're getting wet. Right, obviously it's bored. He's just got that the little holder, so what they're gonna do is they're gonna maintain it in there to keep it as dry as possible. All the way to the backstop. Five nothing Tennessee. Burke scoring standing up. Three wild pitches have brought in a run here in the first two innings. Yeah, it's, I mean it's a frustrating situation for Illinois staff. I mean, tabling again has incredible stuff. It's just really hard to control that. That's the unfortunate thing about having this high spin rate on everything. The ball really snaps out of his hands, and when it gets slick, you start to lose the feel for it. Amos at second with two gone. And bounces into home, two balls and a strike to tears. If you're Tennessee offense, I mean, it's just dead red. I mean, you're looking for something down the middle. Just fouled by Tears to even the count on a fastball. Open activity through the raindrops for Illinois. This is Sam Reed getting loose. 2-2. Two -two. High and deep down this left field line. And just fell. Not by much to the porch. Three run bottom of the second for the Vols. More pitches coming up for tabling. And Tennessee's done a really good job putting pressure on tabling. They're currently four for nine, 444. They have three walks, three of their four extra base hits, or three of their four hits have been for extra base hits, and they've been four for 20, or sorry, they're in 429 with runners in scoring position. Schroeder blocking that, keeping Amick at second base. Count full now to tears, three and two. Two gone, payoff pitch. Inside, ball four. Inning will continue with a walk to tears. Four walks this inning for Tabor. Now batting the left fielder, number eight, Dylan Dryley. Yeah, Tennessee's got the part of the lineup where they stack one, two, three, four lefties in a row. Had a feeling we were gonna see the pitch and change. Play to its full nine innings, regardless of the score. First pitch outside, dry link for ball one. That'll change for Tennessee starting next weekend in SEC play when the 10 run run rule is in effect for each and every conference game. In non conference play, both teams have to agree to it, and both teams really using this weekend to again see where they are before conference play starts. Another one gets away from Schroeder. Both runners will advance. A. now at third, Tears at second. That's the fun thing about being on turf. You see Amick slide here in a second. He literally started at a third of the way from the back. Two in scoring position for Dryling. Now 3-0. A walk would load the bases. People's do up next. Yeah, got to be take all the way right here. Sneaks in the strike zone, three and one. Yeah, interesting stat for, for Reed, too, being lefty and the slider being the, being the quality pitch. Lefty's hit 320 off of him, righty's only hit 200. Line foul, now full count, three and two.
Payoff pitch. Crutch. High and deep to center field. Brad all the way back. But it's gone. Home runs in back-to-back -back games for Dylan Dryling. And Tennessee's made it an 8-0 lead, bottom of the second. Roger, he's so explosive. And again, I, we touched base on this last night, too. He covers all parts of the zone really well. As you can see, he's going to get a fastball up into the zone. And I mean, just absolutely electric hands from Dylan Dryling. It's a straightaway center. Home run number five on the year for Dylan Dryling. This has been a six run bottom of the second for the Vols. Tennessee batting around this inning with Peebles back at the plate. Slowly to the first baseman, bobbled by Westcott. Peebles is aboard. Slick baseball now getting to the fielders as well. Yeah, another one of these cue ball shots from Tennessee. Illinois, very good defensively. Top 50 team in the nation with a 978 fielding percentage. He's at slick conditions. The ball's got a lot of side spin on it and made for a tough play for Westcott. Will be ruled an error first for the Illini in the game. Extends the inning. Balls with Dalton Bargo at the plate. Yeah, just got metrics for the dryling home run. 104 off the bat, 419 feet to dead center. Really impressive for Dylan Dryling. Schroeder blocks the plate. Sticking right at first base will be Peebles. Two gone in what's been a six run bottom of the second. Walk to Bargo that started all of the fun for the Vols here in the bottom of the second. Yeah, one and two. Yeah, Dryling and Bargo very good off of lefties. Dryling came in today hitting 429. Bargo hits 500 off lefties. Got him swinging to close out the inning, but what an inning it was for Tennessee. Six runs. Head coach with the Salinas Packers. 2003 made a stop at Missouri. Was at Missouri from 2004 to 2010, to TCU, to Arkansas, now in Knoxville. Building up this program, getting the balls to Omaha, which is always the goal, getting to that College World Series to the last three years, and the year in between about the best regular season college baseball's ever seen. Yeah, I think we've touched on this a couple of times as well. Coach Vitale has probably brought two of the, his least talented teams to Omaha, a couple of his better teams being that 2022 team and the 2020 team that didn't get to finish the year. Ground up short for Asher Brad starts this year. For Tennessee this season, again, has all the makings of another team that will contend at the top of the SEC and be challenging again in the postseason for anybody. Yeah, and I say least talented. Very lightly. <laughs> just eight guys got drafted from the team last year, but just putting emphasis on that 2022 team. I mean, incredible. Galhasia, the shortstop, struck out swinging first time up, and Drew Beam was certainly a huge part of that. Stepping into the starting role on Sundays after he had missed all of 2019 season. 2020 leading up, or 2020 and then 21 leading up to that in high school. COVID cutting the season short and an injury. Steps in for Tennessee as a freshman and was outstanding. And he's, he's, fun to pit. he's fun to watch pitch because it's a little bit different, you know. He, he maps out his pitches really well. What I mean by that, he's got good spacing between fastball, slider, change up. He does, he does get some swing and miss when needed, but he pitches the contact. He really lets his defense work behind him. Two gone for Camden Janik. Fly out to center, his first trip to the plate. Beam looking for a 1-2-3 third inning. Oh, and 
a strike to Janik. And you'll see that Tennessee changed now. You may have seen Drew Beam earlier holding his glove to his hat. He had pitch calm. He was getting it called in. His hat probably got a little bit wet, so now they're actually calling the signals in to the catcher. Curly, good recovery for the out. Three ground outs to short this right, inning. Curly it. able to make the play each time. Still an 8 nothing. Ten Sam Reed, the lefty on the mound for Illinois, was able to get out of that second inning. Again, they're just counting on him for some length right now and try to save the rest of the bullpen as much as possible. Not only this game, but what's coming up tomorrow in game three. At the moment, Illinois has not announced a starter for game three yet, as Coach Hartlip just wanted to see how the first couple games go in Knoxville with tabling. And obviously last night, saw five innings from Jack Crowder. And a strikeout will start this third inning. Now the the slider. Right Second at bat for Reese Chapman after working a walk last time up. Lefty on lefty rips this down the right field line for a ground rule double. Extra bases for Reese Chapman. Here's, here's the pop from Chapman. You get something that he can get his, ha his hands extended on, absolutely blisters a ball down the right field line. Now batting the second baseman, number one, Christian Moore. This is set the table for this dangerous top of the order for the Volunteers. Tennessee just off a six run inning. Now Christian Moore would like to do some more damage. Cut, strike one for Moore. Talk all about the 2022 success for Tennessee. He was a young guy on that team, kind of finding his role and was such a tough lineup to crack every day with all the veterans. And now he's one of the veterans for this team. Yeah, I mean, it was two freshmen. It was it was Christian Moore and Blake Burke. He's here one, two. They pretty much traded off on lefties and righties. And I mean, it kind of laid the cornerstone for where they're at today. Check swing, did not go around. Ball and a strike to Moore. So Clutchman tendency needed him to be last year. He was the Clemson Regional most valuable player. Two homers against Charlotte in the clinching game of the Clemson Regional. Pops that one foul, a ball and two strikes. Yeah, Christian's brother CJ was taken in the 13th round of the 2014 draft by the Arizona D-backs and we're a few months away from hearing his name called very shortly, I could imagine. Yeah. High and deep in the air to right field. Moore has Homer. A two-run shot, 10-nothing balls. so dynamic at the top part of the lineup. He has power, speed, he's very patient at the plate. As you can see it right here, home run number 32 in his career. Moves him eight away from tying the program record. Gets a fastball out over the plate. Just so strong. Foreman did all he could out of right field trying to rob this just over the wall. Home run number five for Christian Moore. Blake Burke, already a two double day deep in the hole to second, and the shift that time worked for Illinois after he burned them on that back in the first inning. I mean, it was due to happen, right? He's burned them twice with the shift. And, I mean, you, as, as odds play, I mean, it's gotta go into Illinois' hand after that. Squire with a stroke, the walk-up music for Billy Amick. So I'm gonna miss it, strike one against Reed. He's giving up a 
Double and a home run in this inning. Now it's given up three of the 10 runs that the balls have scored. Yeah, Moore's home run, 97 off the bat, 352 feet. So just barely crept over the wall. We'll have a fun little stat for Tennessee home runs and distance coming to you here shortly. I like that. Moore still with the daddy cap on. Slide check swing, and he went around, according to home first base umpire Kevin Sweeney. That'll bring this third inning to a close, but it is a third inning that featured a home run by Christian Moore. It's 10-0 Big Orange as we move to the fourth. At that we mentioned earlier for Tennessee, this was coming into the weekend, so the total will have to be added. They have hit just short of 13,000 feet of home run on the season. That's the equivalent of 2.4 miles. So if you're familiar with campus, that would be making a trip from Lindsey Nelson Stadium up to the top of the hill and back three times. And you know that walk is uphill not both fun. ways. Yeah, not fun. So fastball four strikes to Colton Quagliano from Drew Beam. That was plenty of run support. Chop just fell to third. Tennessee, of course, hitting the home run ball. That has been nothing new in the Tony Vitello era. Two already today, now up to 38 on the season for the Big Orange. Yeah, since the start of the 2021 season, the Vols have hit an NCAA leading 416 home runs. It's incredible. Beam in a good groove. No balls, two strikes against Quagliano. Strikes him out looking. 94 on the fastball by Drew Beam. Yeah, Beam's got some feel for that too. So he's got a little Greg Maddock-esque feel right here. He's starting it off the plate, running it back across. I mean, there's just nothing you can do with that pitch if you're a hitter. Drake Westcott, Big Ten Player of the Week. Pitch strike from Beam. Westcott was able to get aboard with a single last time up. Already two hits this weekend against the Vols. Beam keeps pumping in fastballs. And inside. A ball and two strikes to Westcott. Fastball at 95. Four strikeouts for Drew Beam. Yeah, and that's what you want to do. You saw the slider that moved Westcott's feet. When you got a guy that's got that kind of pop, you want to, you want to get him a little bit uncomfortable. You made him move. You shifted his eyes. Tacked him with there's that two seam, that sinker-like feel at 95. I feel your pain, Westcott. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've been in that situation before too, my man. You just go up there and you have it at bat and feel like you get nothing to hit. It's Valencius. It's ball one. Single for him his last time up as Illinois stranded the bases loaded, did not score in the second. At that point, it was only 2 nothing Tennessee. Then the ball's added on six runs in the bottom of the second, and then two more in the third. Slider for a strike, one and two. Base is empty, two gone. Slide check swing, no swing though, according to Kevin Sweeney, the first base umpire, two and two. Yeah, Vitas making another trip back to Tennessee. Originally from Lockport, Illinois, attended the Baylor School in Chattanooga in high school. Right to first, right to Blake Burke. Inning over. All right, One, two, three, seven in a row set down by Drew Bean. All starts with Kavaris Tears, who had an RBI double back in the first inning, drew a walk, later scored a run in the second. After the rain delay, back underway. 
Cavares tears with a line drive to right, but right to Ryan Mormon. One pitch, one out here in this bottom of the fourth. Yeah, also over that 13 game win streak now, Tennessee has scored 10 plus runs in eight of those 13 victories. All ready to 10 first three innings at the plates. Highlighted by those six runs in the second. Dylan Dryling. One swing brought in three runs in that second inning. A three run homer to straightaway center field. Cracks another one high and deep to right center. Brad and Mormon over. And Mormon tracks it down. Make it up for some lost time right here. Two pitches, two outs. Now batting the catcher, number five, Cannon Evil. Sam Red trying to calm everything down after the starter, Logan, Logan Tabling. He's able to work the first inning in two thirds, but his pitch count got really high. 67 pitches in that time on the mound. Eventually gave up seven runs, all earned on four hits. And had to pitch through the worst of the rain. Cannon Peebles takes strike one. 0 for 2 did reach out an error by the first baseman Westcott last time up. Starting catcher for the balls in this game. Holds it right past Koji Lander. Chance for Reed to get a 1 2 3 fourth inning. He started one game this year, was a starter last year at Eastern Michigan before he transferred to Illinois. Two and two. Lifted to left field. Janet camping under it. And that'll bring this inning to a close. Of all set down in order for the first time in this ball game. First inning, Tennessee has not scored today against the three outs away from doing so. As he again had to wait out the rain delayed, set down seven in a row. Part of this game being interrupted. Now make it eight in a row. One pitch retires Jacob Schroeder to start the fifth. Yeah, nobody's being bashful out of the gate right now. Billy Amick making that play. Now Ryan Mormon will come up. Right fielder that reached on a fielder's choice E6 in the second inning that loaded the bases for the Illini when they were only trailing by a 2-0 score. Brody Harding would ground out second to close out the inning and that threat by fighting Illini. Yeah, good to see after he sits so long. Velo's still there. He's still fastball hovering around 93, 96. Justin is there, two and one. Fourth start for Beam this year, and the final one before conference play begins next week in Tuscaloosa. Just outside ball four, and that'll be the first walk of the day by Bean. Now batting the second baseman, number two, Brody Harding. Brody Harding. Round out to second that ended that Illinois threat back in the second inning. Ninth hitter in the order for the fighting line eye. 
Falling off the fastball at 92 miles per hour from Bean. Yeah, Harding's been productive over his last six games, or over his last eight games, 367 average, no extra base hits, but quality at bats. Really battles up and gets on base for his guys. Back in the strike zone, one and two. Everybody clap your hands. Come on, y'all. Mormon at first with one out. Beam stayed away, two and two on Harding. Lined in the opposite field for a base hit. All the way to the left field corner. Mormon to third on the double by Harding. More opposite field power for Brody Harding. Yeah, we've seen a lot of it from him this weekend. He's very patient at the plate. He waits on getting a ball up in the zone, drives this ball down the left field line for his first extra base hit in that little bit. Opportunity again for Illinois. Two in scoring position with only one out and the top of the order back to the plate with the center fielder Asher Brad. Brown ball to short. Curling will make the throw as the run crosses the plate. Mormon scores on the ground out by Brad to get Illinois on the board at 10 to 1. And you see that a lot from, from the left side of the infield from Tennessee. You play on turf, the ball's a little slick. You saw Curley use a, a basically a bounce pass over to first base from there. Just a little easier than trying to unload with a slick baseball from out in the hole. Two gone, top of the fifth. Now Cal Haza, short stop to the plate. Beam starts him with a strike. 0 for 2 for Hayza so far at the plate. A strikeout and a ground out short. Beam in front of 2. That fastball velocity back at 93 miles per hour. Well, it's been a long day. Not necessarily in terms of pitch count. Next pitch will be a 65th, but waiting out some long innings of the plate plus a Plus 40 minute rain delay. The 0 2. Got him swinging. Drew Beam with five strikeouts and five innings of one record where Florida's down at eight and four, but I mean, that Florida team's loaded. It's going to be a fun 30 game journey in conference play that will start next week as Bargo sends this one high, sends it deep and completely out of the yard. Dalton Bargo with a solo homer makes it 11 1 Big Orange. Bargo stays on a tear against left-handed pitching again. He came in today entering with a 500 average against lefties. Get something out over the plate that he can get extended on. One thing that we've seen from him, he creates a ton of backspin. When he gets a ball that he can elevate, it really carries. Perfect bat flip as well for Dalton Bargo. Second home run as a Tennessee Volunteer. Dean Curley, a couple of strikeouts for him today after earlier in the week, that three-homer game against Kansas State. Tennessee bashing out three home runs already in this ballgame, drawing a three-run shot in the second, two-run shot by Moore in the third, and now a solo homer by Bargo to begin the bottom of the fifth. Base hit all the way to the wall in left field for Dean Curley. He's got a double. Look at that one real quick. 
Yeah, almost every one of his base hits have <laughs> all been extra base hits. It's incredible. Six homers, now that's his second double of the year. Getting Curly in a good groove as Reese Chapman's at the plate. Speaking of doubles, he doubled last time up on a sharp line drive to right field. Another line drive to right, this time the play made by Mormon. One gone, bottom of the fifth. Chad has taken some good swings today, though. Everything he's put in place has been really hard contact. Unfortunately, he hit it, and Mormon made a very good play. Top of the order, back to the plate with Christian Moore. Smacked a two-run homer his last time up over the right field wall. Simo Hitmo. I wanted to hit it out to the porch in left field. Knocks it foul and scatters the Illinois dugout to start this at bat. Home run number 32 for Christian Bohr in a Tennessee uniform. His fifth of the year. Home run was hit off Sam Reed, who has stayed on the mound for the last two and two thirds innings after the starter tabling went first inning and two thirds, running into trouble in the second. One and two. Early in second, one gone. Now full count. Try to be extra careful with more of the play. <coughs> Sticks around at three and two. In the third inning, the fifth homer that payoff pitch. High ball four, two aboard for Tennessee. Now batting the first baseman, number 25, Blake Bird. Sam Reed may have seen his time on the mound come to an end. Mark Allen, the pitching coach, will come out. He also does some other visits made trying to be careful with Blake Burke coming up here. And what will be the second time that Burke has faced Reed, it was Burke who grounded out into the shift in shallow right. Two on with one gone. Swing and a miss for Burke for strike one. Started his game with two doubles, both against the shift into left field. So two for three game already. 15 straight games, he's reached base for the Vols. Crushes it. Go ahead and tell your friends about another Burke Ball. <laughs> 14 to one, Big Orange. It's impressive. When he hits him, he doesn't get cheated. I mean, he gets a slider up over the plate and hits this ball into the fourth row of the parking lot. Another home run moves him five away from tying Tennessee's all-time record of 40. 
Two homers this inning for Tennessee. That one was destroyed. Yeah, that says it all. I mean, when you look at somebody that just has raw power, he's got to be at the top of the list of any MLB draft ranking. And then more lefty batters do up after that. Tears and Dryling. It all starts with Amick. Single back in the first, a walk and a strikeout on the day. And you know he wants to join in on the home run party. He would love to. Hutchings is a guy, too. Gets a lot of balls elevated off of him. 60% of pitches or are, are balls put in play are in the air. A McNine homers coming into today tied for the NCAA lead. Into the gap in left center for a base hit. Amick will hold it first with a single. Multi-hit game, Billy Amick. Now batting the center fielder, number from 21. last year, he hit 413 at Clemson. It's really impressive because he he's not up there to walk. Like there, there's very little take in his game, and typically you don't see that high of an average for somebody. But man, him and he just he barrels up everything. Another man aboard for Kavaris Tears at an RBI double back in the first. Just another Tennessee batting order that doesn't give up. We said that over and over again about Tennessee two years ago back in 2022. This year, very similar conversation. And deep really beyond the nine that factor into the mix. Tennessee's got a much deeper bench, it feels like, this year than it did two years ago or last year. Yeah, they've got, they've got a lot of diversity. They can do a lot of things with their lineup. But what's impressive, man, this, all these lefties hit lefties very well. I mean, Tears hits lefties at a 533 clip. Dryling, 429. Bargo, 500. It's down the line and just fell. So it's just, there's just not an easy matchup, you know. I mean, they can mix and match, and they can load it full of lefties or righties if they need to. Disadvantage. Hutchings a 2-7-0 ERA last year as a redshirt sophomore. Had only two relief outings, both in Big Ten play against Michigan and Northwestern. Schroeder keeps it around the plate. Foul by Tears. Stick around to two and two. Yeah, that fastball for Hutchins is going to play around 85, 87. Big sweeper on the curveball is 71 to 74, and he's also going to mix in the changeup at 80 to 82. <laughs> Bouncing ball to first. Out at second. And Tears aboard on the fielder's choice. Two gone in this bottom of the fifth. Change for Tennessee coming up. This is the spot of Dylan Dryling. Colby Backus will come to the plate. Junior outfielder. Dryling already a three-run homer in this ball game. A great contribution by him to what is now a 13-run lead for the Vols. Back is three for seven at the plate to start this season. Native of Johnson City, Tennessee, went to Daniel Boone High School before making his way to Walter State and transferring to the University of Tennessee. Yeah, Coach Vitello on the call earlier this week said that Backus is going to get his opportunities. He's looked really good in practice, really developed from the fall till now. A guy that has an unbelievable amount of power. Knocks that one fell. A ball and two strikes now to Backus. Get 
19 homers for Walter State last year. 75 runs batted in, hit 384, along with team high 19 doubles. Juco All-American. Two and two. Tears at first with two gone. Swing and a miss, strike three. The throw to first to complete the put out, and that'll close out the inning, but the Volunteers had some fun in this frame thanks to a solo homer by Bargo, then a three-run Burt Bomb by Blake. Leading off of the fighting Illini, the left fielder number 17, Camden Janik. Janik leading off the sixth inning. Only on for the sixth time this season. Eight strikeouts in his five innings of work. He's only given up one base hit. The center and a ground out to short for Janik already today. Loy just missing there, two and two. Yeah, that's what Tennessee staff's liked about Loy so far. He is around the plate. He he really attacks hitters. Right back on the attack. A strikeout of Janik starts the time in the mound for Dolan Loy. Yeah, same thing right here. Sets him up with a curveball away that just misses, elevates a fastball to get Janik to chase out of the zone. Colton Quagliano, third baseman, 0 for 2. And a strikeout for him going up against Drew Beam through the first five innings. Swing and a miss on the fastball at 88. Back to back strikeouts for Loy. But now completed, two gone. There's another K for Queso. Yeah, Lloyd does a good job. He's left, he's a big frame guy. As you can see, he throws a little bit across of his body, he hides it really now well. Got a lot of depth on that curveball. <laughs> two gone, Drake Westcott. Big Ten Player of the Week. One for two in this ball game against Tennessee. After going one for five in last night's opener of the series. Pops it up. Amick puts it away in foul territory, and that's a one part of that. He'll be leading off this bottom of the sixth inning, coming over from NC State to the University of Tennessee, but the transfer portal has really changed the game. Yeah, Peebles was the gem of this transfer, for, this transfer portal draft. He was the, the fifth-rated transfer by D1 Baseball, and you're going to see Dalton Bargo, who was the number 41-rated player. Already homered today. Bargo staying in the SEC, going from Missouri to Tennessee. Peebles, a great start to his career at NC State. Freshman All-America for the Wolfpack. 352 average, drove in 50 runs. That one just fell. And again, now it's all on a year-by-year -year basis for coaches to try and build up their roster. Still, of course, high school recruiting, development, and a lot of players are being rewarded for their patience, sticking with one program and getting their opportunity to play, but Transfer Portal has changed the game. 
Yeah, Coach Vitello t spoke on it earlier in the week too. Like when they're going to the portal, I mean, they're looking at guys that they think are going to be high leverage, like high draft round or high draft picks coming up in the future, you know, and then they're taking those younger guys. They're getting here, giving them time. You know, if you're good enough to play out of the gate, you will, and if not, we'll give you your development. Certainly finding the right spot. Several players last year for this Tennessee program. Peebles with a base head to center. This first hit of the day for the Volunteers, a leadoff single to start the sixth inning. But you look at left side of the infield here, it goes Zane Denton coming over from Alabama, Maui Yahuna from Kansas. Yep, I mean, Tennessee's a destination spot, not only in baseball, but a lot now of other sports. The They've leader. really kind of jumped ahead of the curve of a lot of other programs, and it's paying dividends. Yeah, that Dalton Connect kid is really good for the he's men's right. basketball team. I heard he's okay. <laughs> Luckily, your SEC Player of the Year. Example of how Rick Barnes has used the transfer portal for the balls as they're going to get going in a few minutes against Kentucky. Just across campus at the Food City Center. Peebles with the base hit, and then Tennessee goes to the bench with Ethan Payne taking over as a pinch runner. Here's Bargo. Crushed a home run last time up, crushes that one fell. Start this at bat. A second home run in a Tennessee uniform. Time at Missouri. He was a primary DH as a freshman for the Tigers, hit 279. Five homers, 23 RBI. I think before a lot of people talked about the transfer portal and saying, okay, well, how does the team gel together? You know, how can the new guys get used to their surroundings? Well, now these players are at least three or four years kind of used to that scenario and understanding that truly every year is a new team. Yeah, for sure. I mean, at the beginning, I, I think there was a little bit of tension with everybody. You know, the coaches didn't know how it was going to work. The players didn't. Now you're kind of seeing, you know, we've given it a couple of years. Things are starting to smooth out. It's a lot easier to make that jump from place to place. And, you know, we're going to take a little time, and, and we're going to see how this all shakes out for everybody, see if there, if it is ever going to be reined in at some point or if it's going to, you know, continue to be the Wild West. Down the left field line. Just fell. Fargo will stick around at two balls and two strikes. Yeah, I think the thing that amazes me the most about those transfer reports, like you said, it's the it's the in-conference transfers that happen. It's just so wild to see these guys on, on one team and competing for an SEC championship and then turn around next year and, and they're in a different program. There's an example in women's basketball, a player named Jemaya Mingo Young started her career at Mississippi State, a couple years there, a couple years at Alabama, closing out her time now at Auburn. So three schools in the SEC West. That's wild. That's an example of how things have changed. I bet she's a fan favorite. She gets Is that a good year for Auburn? Auburn fans love her. Yeah, she, I'm sure she doesn't get booed anywhere else in, in the conference. This one skips away from Schroeder. That was ball four, so Payne will take second on the walk to Bargo. Now batting the shortstop, number 23, Dean Curley. Freshman Dean Curley. Double last time up after a couple of strikeouts. First two trips to the plate. Smokes that base hit in the left field. Base is now loaded for Tennessee. Multi-hit game, Dean Curley. It's not like Tennessee needed a lot of help coming into the season anyway with the depth that they have one through nine. Reese Chapman with the bases loaded, takes outside. Up before about a little bit of a slow start to the season for Chapman. Just one for 11 and some limited playing time coming into today, but he's already 
Drawn a walk, hit a double in this ball game. At the end of the bat down the left field line. Janik chasing after that foul ball. On the new additions to Lindsey Nelson Stadium and that bullpen under the seats. As Lindsey Nelson Stadium continues to go through a lot of renovations that will certainly continue into the offseason. It's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, this is the beginning phases. You can see the, the tarp area up there. That's going to eventually turn into a party deck, very similar to what they have at football. Uh, tons of added new seating. We've had a ton of people coming out to the game. They've set attendance records almost every weekend that they've played. It's certainly been impressive. Fans know they got to buy season tickets if they want to be around for postseason baseball. I think every Tennessee fan learned that back in 2021. It's made for a fun, festive atmosphere even really early in the season before conference play begins. Three balls and a strike on Chapman. Nowhere to put him with the bases loaded and nobody out in this bottom of the sixth. Sends it high. Sends it deep to left field. Grand slam, Reese Chapman. Tennessee 18, Illinois 1. gut feeling that Chapman was going to come unglued on this 3-1 pitch. He gets something out over the plate, and this is the power that we were talking about. Even though the start's been a little slow, he is electric. Almost he clears the entire porch off of Grand slam home run. First homer this year for Chapman. His third as a member of the Vols after having two last year. At 415 feet, Whew. opposite field homer. Power on full display for the Volunteers today. Blake Laurie will pop this up to the second baseman Harding, and that'll be the first out here in the sixth inning. Already four runs of score. See, just went with Lori, and now Charlie Taylor stepping into the spot of Blake Burke. Again, if you're just joining us, run rule not in effect for today's game. So this game will be played the full nine innings regardless of the score. Number 14, Charlie Taylor. Both Tennessee and Illinois continue getting some work in, and Charlie Taylor skies this one high, the medium deep left field. Shortstop back pedaling Hayza there for the catch. Camden Bates next up. Off the bench for Tennessee in the spot of Billy Amick. <laughs> 18 to 1, Tennessee. Yeah, we're going to have an opportunity to see a lot of new faces here for Tennessee as they're starting to make way through that dugout. Bates, the freshman from Washington, Oklahoma. Tough spot down the third base line. And he'll beat it out. Infield single for Bates. Now batting the center fielder, number nine, Hunter. Hunter Ensley took over in center field for Kavaris Tears in the top of the sixth inning. That was first at bat coming up here. After he played in last night's game, played in center field and went 0 for 3. Hutchins with the fastball for a strike. Front, no balls, and two strikes to Ensley. Oh, 
Just behind Schroeder. Late break for Bates in the second. Yeah, Schroeder's earned his keep today for sure, man. He's He's been pretty solid considering the circumstances and what he's dealt with early on in the game and now. Slick baseball led to some wild pitches for Tabling and Illinois early in the ball game. And a strikeout for Hutchings will close out this bottom of the sixth. The sixth inning that featured grand slam home run by Reese Chapman as we move to the seventh. Let's get through the late innings here in Knoxville. Gavin Bennett, one of the catchers on this Illinois roster, first to the plate to start the seventh inning. Bennett one for eight so far at the plate. A couple of appearances and has made a couple of starts. This is the spot of Valencius, the DH. Two strikes on Bennett. Into center field for a base hit. Bennett is aboard with his pinch hit leadoff single. Now batting, the catcher number eight, Jacob Schroeder. Jacob Schroeder has been busy behind the plate for Illinois, coming up for the third time at the plate. Been fighting a line eye over two so far in this ballgame. Garcia starts him off with a 92 mile per hour fastball. Zone again at 92. Count's gone even at two and two. Still fastballs from Garcia. Yep. Totally different look for Tennessee in the field, too. Backus in left, Inslee in center, Chapman in right. Curley moves over to third, Bates at short, Laurie at second, Payne at first, and now Charlie Taylor behind the dish. I want smacked foul, third base side. Changes all over for Tennessee, but again, testing the depth, really important for Tony Vitello in Tennessee. Is still some important midweek games coming up, of course, as we've talked about before. Conference play starts next weekend against Alabama. And a strikeout for Garcia against Schroeder. That's another K for Queso. But you never know who on that bench is going to be tested, not just in the next few weeks, but even later in the season. Really good pitch here from Garcia. He's been fastball 92 away. That was the slider at 85 that catches the outside part of the plate. Your attention, please. Pitch hitting for the fighting line. Number seven, Christian Smith. Garcia starts this at bat against Christian Smith with a strike. Smith in the spot of Ryan Mormon, who had been the starting right fielder in this game and gone on base twice. Smith one for four at the plate this year. Garcia gets in front, 0-2.
called third strike. Fastball at 92 from J.J. Garcia. Yeah, Garcia's got some length, and he's got a lot of movement. Arm side run on his fastball. We went 92, 92, 92. Catches the outside part of the plate. I mean, just really, really tough when he's like this. Brody Harding, the second baseman. First pitch strike, another fastball for Garcia. Slider for a strike. Garcia making his third outing of the season. Opportunity to get a scoreless seventh inning after Bennett let off the frame with a single. He's had to stay at first base through back-to-back -back strikeouts. Shallow left field. Back is there to close out the frame. That leadoff hit for Bennett, then three straight outs by Garcia on the mound. Seventh inning is loaded as it can be, getting ready for this 2024 season. Can't wait for conference play to begin next weekend. Yeah, we got to see a little bit of that matchup early in the year as Tennessee squared off against Oklahoma. Oklahoma got the best of Tennessee with a 5-1 victory in 10 innings. Since then, 13 straight wins for the Vols. Looking good in this one to make it 14 straight. We'll be back as beginning the seventh inning for the Volunteers at the plate. Second at bat that he's had after striking out last time up in the spot of Dylan Dryling. You had a three-run homer in the second inning. It's Reed Gannon now working on the mound. So he goes from the SEC to the Big Ten. He was at Kentucky before. Tennessee's been very good in the non-conference so far. Tennessee has not lost a regular season non-conference weekend series since 2020 against Wright State. And they've swept 13 of the 15 regular season non-conference opponents they faced during that time. That Wright State team was pretty good. You know, a year later, got to come here to Knoxville and nearly beat Tennessee in game one of that Knoxville Regional before Drew Gilbert had other ideas. Yeah, that one of the, we talked about that off air during the rain delay. Maybe one of the most electric games that's ever been played here at Lindsey Nelson Stadium. Back is hit by the pitch. He's aboard to start the seventh inning. Now batting the first baseman, number 12, Ethan Payne. Ethan Payne stepping in. Took over as a pinch runner for Cannon Peebles. Payne three for seven of the plate to begin this season. Chops it into right field for a base hit. Man on the corners for Tennessee with nobody out to start the seventh. Designated hitter number 16, Dalton Bargo. Dalton Bargo has been one of the few starters to remain throughout this ball game. The DH coming up to the plate. Already drawn a couple of walks. And a solo home run in the fifth. This ball skips away from Schroeder. 19 runs for Tennessee. Another run crosses the plate thanks to a wild pitch. Fourth time today that's happened. Yeah, I see a nice bath in uh, Schroeder's future. And it's wild to think about it, too. You see Bargo stats 367, two homers, 10 RBIs. And the guy can't even get in the lineup every day. 
That's why he's going to take advantage of this opportunity for more at-bats, even with a lot of the starters being pulled from this ball game for the Vols. So a few changes for Illinois in this bottom of the seventh. But still Bargo at the plate. And the strike for Gannon working with Janik. Gannon lost two years at Kentucky. Did not make an appearance redshirted as a freshman. And then outing against Dayton on April 4th of last year. Here he walks Bargo. This will be the third time he's been on the mound working for the Fighting Illini. Your attention, please. Pitch hitting for Tennessee. Number 40, Hunter High. Hunter High next up is a pinch hitter. We'll see whether or not he gets to face Gannon as pitching coach Mark Allen is out once again for Illinois. Serving as the pinch hitter in the spot of Dean Curley. Yeah, going to see a lot of usage from Clark on the fastball. 90% of pitches thrown so far have been the heater. Give him the heater, Ricky. <laughs> there it is, 89. Where do you got Major League at? Is that, is that the your favorite baseball movie? Bull Durham's number one for me. Same. Especially with all the years I was in the minors. Um, <laughs> it's the most realistic movie. Major League's great, though. It gets you ready for the season. Yeah, I would go Bull Durham 1. Base hit for Hunter High just down the left field line. Tennessee will add to its lead. Payne scores, and it's an RBI double Hunter High. Yeah, the lefties have taken advantage of the left field line today. You've seen it with Blake Burke. Now you see it with Hunter Hines. Gets a fastball out over the plate. Shoots it just past the dive in Quagliano to make it 20 to now one. Now the right fielder, Big. number 13, Reese. First base hit is a member position, Reese Chapman to the plate, fresh off a grand slam homer his last time up. Rookie of the year too. Little big league, like that yep. little stretch, outstanding. Yep. Baseball movies. Great movies. Early 90s. Sandlot. Yeah. Wow. Haven't seen any of the remakes, though. <laughs> Stuck to the original. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Some classics you just should not change. Although Angels in the Outfield in that time, too, that was a remake of what was a pretty good movie yep. in the 50s, directed by a Tennessee alum, Clarence Brown. Awesome. There's always a connection. There you go. And Clarence Brown Theater here on campus. Yeah, I love Little Big League. It was tough, though. I mean, King Griffey Jr. was my idol, <laughs> and they portrayed him as the villain through the whole movie. He looks a lot nicer than Randy Johnson did. This is, that's true. And now Janet catches a foul tip, and home plate umpire is giving him a little bit of a break. That's Danny Crick. Also, more baseballs needed again. This has been a game where baseballs, also all the work they've done on the mound, killing the budget for Tennessee baseball operations. Tennessee wearing out the scoreboard, though, up 20 to 1. Two in scoring position, no one out here. And that will hit Chapman. Base is now loaded, but hopefully Chapman will be all right. Yeah, just a two seam that runs back in. Looks like it catches him right on the hip. Did not look like it felt very pleasant. Now batting the All the times you're hit by the pitch, how long would that pain or can you stick with you? Yeah, it just depends. You know, obviously, um, you hate getting hit in ankle, wrist. You know, that's probably the two worst because um, that one will hang for a while. You know, anything like in the back or 
or lower leg or something like that, eh, you know, it, that typically goes away pretty quick. But, yeah, any, any, any bony points, right, wrist, elbow, ankle, mm, not fun. Base is loaded. Brad Key-Lori at the plate. Ball and a strike to Lori. Popped up to second. He took over for Christian Moore at second base. Played previously at the College of Central Florida last year. Wabash Valley College before that. Yeah, a couple of elite junior college programs. You see those two names in the Junior College World Series, along with Walter State on a regular basis. Two and two. I've had good pacing to the game this so far today. Closing in on three and a half hours with a rain delay, rain delay mixed, mixed in. in. <laughs> We appreciate you guys sticking with us, though, man. It's been fun. Screamer of the middle. Base hit for Lori. Tennessee will add to its lead. A two-run single for Bradkey Lori. 22-1, Tennessee. Short, compact swing here by Lori. Absolute screamer. Back up the shoot. Now the catcher, that makes 14, ten, that is Charlie Tennessee's Taylor. 18th hit on the day. Stat line: Tennessee is 18 for 37. That is a 486 clip. They have seven base on balls to seven strikeouts. They are 11 for 20 for a 550 average with runners on. They are 10 for 15 with runners in scoring position. More opportunities. Two on. Nobody out here in this inning. By the way, Laurie, congratulations to him on his first hit of the season. Had been 0 for 10 in the plate, but one of the things I loved about what he had done so far this year, he'd gotten on base six times with walks and scored six runs. Yeah, he played a, he played a good bit down in the Shriners Invitational down in Texas, and he really grinded through some at-bats. Uh, had a little bit of unfortunate luck, a couple good plays made against him, but really, really did a good job working counts and, and finding ways to contribute. Charlie Taylor, pop out to short first time up. Reserve catchers on this Tennessee roster working on his MBA, a teaching assistant. Went on the trip to South America before his semester started with the MBA program. It's been spotlighted by the University of Tennessee for it takes a volunteer campaign. All edited together by BFL Films alum, Isaac Fowler. See him earlier today here in the press box at Lindsey Nelson Stadium. Strikeout for the first out in this bottom of the seventh inning. Already five runs across the plate. Now it's Bates who had an infield single his first time up in the spot of Billy Amick. Smashes that deep down the right field line. Smith giving chase. Goes into a slide. Wow, what a play. And makes the grab. Both runners will advance, but excellent work by Smith down the right field line. Smith covered a ton of ground. Looked like a ball that was going to shift out of, out of play. Now I mean, the center fielder, incredible nine, sliding Andrew. catch. Tip of the cap to Christian Smith. Now two in scoring position, two gone in this bottom of the seventh. It's been a third straight four-run inning for Tennessee. I wonder if anybody had that on their bingo card. Line foul by Inslee. So this is the most runs that Tennessee has scored in a game. Obviously, the run rule cuts down on some opportunities for some of these scores, but the run rule not in effect for this game. The other one in the 20s was the win over Albany, 21-6, back on February 24th.
Yeah, Tennessee scored in every inning so far except for the fourth. Then just the same thing, they're just patient, you know. They have the ability to play for a big inning, but they've cut down a lot of swing and miss, and, and that was, that's the change from this year to last year. The team last year was very potent, and they went through streaks where everybody was hot, and then there was a, a stretch where a bunch of them got cold. So they did have to play for the big inning. This team, completely different. They can really string together hits one through nine in the lineup. That's going to be needed coming up in SEC play because especially every Friday, Saturday starter you see is an elite strikeout pitcher oh, yeah, in this league. for sure. I mean, that's what it takes to be successful in this conference. We highlighted it earlier yesterday. I think the league average was 313 across the, con the conference. That's for everybody. Like, every team in the conference is 313 average, and the ERA was under three. It's like a 266 or 267. This is amazing to think about. That is premier talent at a college level. Two and two on Inslee. And that hit him. Base is now loaded again for the balls. And you can see Clark's trying to pitch inside. He's had a couple of them get away from him. And, and this does not Batty, sound pleasant. That one sounded 20, like it stuck Kobe a little Backer. bit to Hunter Inslee. Icon, Whoa, we Clark having to deal with the bases loaded. Two gone. Colby back us to the plate. Colby. Tennessee batting around. The inning started with him being hit by a pitch. You know, we, we talk about all the premier talent in the SEC, Roger. We, we said this yesterday, too. It's a crazy thing. There's only two SEC players in the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. <laughs> one of them played here in Knoxville, recently inducted. The other one was Frank Thomas, the big hurt. It is impressive. And congratulations to Todd Helton. We made everybody excited to see him get that well-deserved honor. His jersey number three retired along with Legends Condridge Holloway, Phil Garner. Inside half strike one and two on Bacchus. You can bet coming up. Hall of Fame speech for Todd Helton. He's going to talk a lot about his home of Knoxville, Central High, and then at University of Tennessee. He played a, a big part. I know he did in, in my lifetime of wanting to be a Tennessee fan and wanting to come here and grew up and come watch Todd play here in the early and mid-90s, and, and it was so much fun. You know, people think about Todd and how well he hit. It is it is crazy thing about how good his numbers are on the mound and what he did through and through. Strikeout will close out this four-run bottom of the seventh as Tennessee makes it a 22-1 score against Illinois. We Number 38, Colin Jennings. Underway in the eighth inning. Tennessee with his 22 to 1 lead against Illinois. Pinch hitter to the plate for the Fighting Illini. Colin Jennings. Taking over in the spot of Asher Brad, the center fielder who brought in the only run for Illinois with a ground out back in the fifth. Strikeout starts the time for Sharp on the mound. That's another K for Queso. Sharp looks good so far. Fastball's been ranging up 87, 89. Here is that curveball that we were talking about. I think that was more of the slider that was 82, 83. Really quality pitch. Calhaza, the starting shortstop for Illinois. Oh, for three in this game with a pair of strikeouts and his time at the plate. Speaking of Hall of Famers, he was named after the Hall of Famer Cal Ripken Jr. Sharp right back in the strike zone. There's the curve. Back 
back-to-back -back strikeouts, Braden Sharp. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Yeah, on full display right there, fastball again, curveball at 70, 70 to 72, and there's the slider again for the second put out at 80 miles an hour. Camden Janik, who started this game out in left field, moved behind the plates. Third and hit on the order for the Illini. Quickly down to his last strike at 0 and 2. Talk about the importance of a game like this, spot like this. Tennessee was such a huge lead, but this could be such a boost for Braden Sharp moving forward. In the air to right. Chapman is there. Inning over. Sharp sets down the Illini. 1 2 3 here in this against both so far. Speaking of arms on the mound, Corey Bunselmeyer taking over for Illinois. Ethan Payne will be the first batter he'll face to start the bottom of the eighth. Season high, 22 runs for the Vols in this game. Crack down the left field line. And it'll just fall in for a foul ball. It is a tricky wind that the teams have been dealing with. Uh, no, certainly last night, but today has been wind has been a factor as well coming in from right field. Yeah, last night it was it was chaos early on. It, wind was just blowing crazy. It was tough to make a routine catch in a fly ball. You always see some squirrely stuff happen down this left field line. I don't know if it's because you got the football complex right there and it creates a wind tunnel, but there's those everything kind of gets pushed back into play and around. You'll see left fielders overrun stuff all the time. So a long, loud strike one for Ethan Payne. Yeah, Roger, I think we're about to have a little bit of fun. We saw Coach Vitello talk to a first base umpire just a little bit ago. Looks like we have Braden Sharp on deck. Certainly like that. Because you have the DH spot due up next. Changes all over the place for Tennessee. Vargo had been along with Chapman, really the only two that have stayed in the lineup. Three and one to paint. From Corey Bunselmeyer, a senior from Ava, Illinois. Previously attended Wren Lake Community College before making his way to Champaign. Lead off walk will start Tennessee's eighth. Just look at some of the scouting reports on Bunselmeyer. Fastball is going to play around 88 to 90. He's got a slider now and a change up. A couple of things to highlight. He did Brady have 17 Sharp. walks in 25 innings. He also hit 10 batters during that frame as well. I'm Braden Sharp getting to bat. After he just worked a 1 2 3 top of the eighth inning. First pitch outside for a ball. First collegiate at bat for Sharp. Freshman out of the Woodlands, Texas. Don't have any of his batting numbers from high school, but I imagine pretty good hitter as well as a pitcher. Sends this one high into center field. This is well back. Just on the warning track, the grab is made as Sharp certainly gave that one a ride. No, oh, another 10 feet, and I think this Tennessee <laughs> dugout would have exploded. Sharp, a pitcher, hit a home run in a very rare at bat. He might get to take the daddy cap fur coat home with him. He could wear it to class coming up all next week. Line drive screamer by Hunter High for another base hit. First two hits for Hunter High in a Tennessee uniform in this game against Illinois. Yeah, some young guys getting a lot of experience. You've seen Sharp on the mound and swinging. He was a two-way guy. Hunter High, we've seen him some here. Starting to get some production, now showing a little bit right of field. oppo. Double his last time up now. Two double performance. Tennessee has scored in all 
innings except for one, that scoreless fourth right after the rain delay. But knocking on the door, a two in scoring position, one gone here for Reese Chapman, who had a grand slam home run to the porch. Back in the sixth inning. Chapman a double, the grand slam homer, also a walk, hit by pitch already in this game. Another base hit for Reese Chapman. Three hit performance as this goes all the way to the wall, brings in two more runs. Reese Chapman has picked up three hits, driven in six runs today for the Vols. He's been very impressive. We've seen a couple of these very similar swings right here. Pull side down the line, hit very hard. He showed some oppo pop yesterday. This is something the Tennessee staff has been wanting to see from him. Again, he has major pop. If he could just get a little bit more consistency, I think we'll find him, he'll find his way in the lineup. Start of the year, just one for 11, but today's changed everything. With a six RBI performance and three hits, all for extra bases. Brad Key-Laurie, two run single for his first hit of the year. Back in the seventh. Out away by Laurie, ball and two strikes. Hitting batters, that one just buzzed the tower. Two and two. I got a whole lot of money. Called third strike. Bunselmeyer gets out number two. Bunselmeyer, 88 mile an hour fastball on the way down. That's what you're going to see from him. He pitches at a 60% ground ball rate, so you know that you're going to get some sync on this fastball. Same thing, had a little bit of run off the plate. Off the Trying to limit the damage. Two runs here in the eighth inning. Now Charlie Taylor. Max it high down the first base line. Justin, the front row. Chapman still at second after his two run double. Meyer in front, 0-2. Oh Last chance for Tennessee to add to its total of season high 24 runs in this game against Illinois. Strikeout will close out the inning for Bunsen Meyer. Tennessee adds two in this bottom of the eighth inning. Thanks. Fastball between 85 to 88, slider 76 to 80, change up around 79 to 80. Righties hit 333, lefties hit 500 off of Austin Huntley. Swinging strike one for Illinois at the plate. With 
Reeder, who serves as a pinch hitter. Reagan Reeder. Another breaking ball over the plate. Strike two. Teams had to wait for about 40, 45 minutes through a rain delay from the top of the fourth inning to the bottom of the fourth. Tennessee with really consistent offense throughout this ball game. So that fastball runs inside. So again, really everything went to plan if you're Tennessee. Five homers in this ball game. And then Drew Beam certainly looked sharp with five innings only allowing a run. And that was after a long rain delay. Yeah, like I said, in line to collect that win, which will move him into the top ten overall. Looks good so far. I think, you know, Causey's going to be your definite Friday guy. You know what, you're going to get a beam on Saturday. You're going to figure out the Sunday thing before you get into SEC play. Pinch hitting for Illinois, number 32, Jaden Camilla. Jaden Camilla serving as a pinch hitter in the spot of Drake Westcott. We'll see him back in the lineup for sure tomorrow for Illinois, the reigning Big Ten Player of the Week. Okay, line eye again. At a tough game in a lot of ways because hopefully you pour some length from your starter, Logan, Logan Tabling. He labored through his time on the mound and inning in two-thirds in really tough, rainy conditions. And then he had to really work the bullpen after that. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those games that just got away from him in general. You know, it's tough to you get in here and some of your bullpen guys have trouble throwing strikes and kind of lose a little bit of focus here at some of the bats. And it's just one of those things where you're not happy with the outcome, but you flush it and you go back and, and you try to make do with tomorrow and, and find a way to squeak out a win. Mia fouls one back our direction in the press box. That one was close. We, we <laughs> almost had to make a play. <laughs> Real close. I never want to hear it land on the roof. Maybe it went just beyond. It. One, two. Little high to even the count. One o'clock, the start time for tomorrow to wrap up this final non-conference weekend of the year for Tennessee. And for Illinois, Big Ten play does not start next weekend. Coming up next weekend, it'll be Southern Indiana at home, but in two weeks, it'll be Illinois at Indiana to start its run in the Big Ten. Southern Indiana, that's who had Tennessee, or Tennessee had here during the midweek. Called third strike. Curve ball over outside corner. Back to back strikeouts. Payne on the mound. Now batting the designated hitter, number 14, Gavin Bennett. Very Hunley on the mound. Yeah, Southern Indiana gave Tennessee all they wanted in the midweek. That was that 2 1 contest. Tennessee beat Kansas State the night before 15 to 5. And then Southern Indiana really shut the doors on them. Since then, a 6-3 win against Illinois. Now this one 24-1 here in the ninth. Off Humley's foot. Ricocheting to first base. Payne is there, and this ball game is over. Hopefully everything okay Tennessee for Austin Humley. Everything was A-OK -okay for the Tennessee Volunteers in this ball game, picking up a 24-1 victory over Illinois.